Hello and welcome to this Dairy XNet Dairy Educational video. I'm Dr. Robert Van Son, Extension Veterinarian with Penn State University. Our topic today is a very important topic, an overview of work safety and health issues on dairy farms. Our presenter is Dr. Dennis Murphy from the Pennsylvania State University. You can see the description of his topic today. Before we get started, I'd like to draw your attention to other great information on dairy farms and dairy production systems that's available through Dairy XNet. We have many other educational videos and previous webinars that are archived on our website. You have opportunities to find other resource information. You can like Dairy XNet on Facebook to get announcements and new information. You can sign up for our newsletter and you can follow Dairy XNet on Twitter. So our speaker today is Dr. Dennis Murphy. Dennis is the nationwide insurance professor of agricultural safety and health and extension safety specialist at Penn State University. He received this PhD from Penn State University and MS and BS degrees from Illinois State University. Dennis provides direction and leadership for agricultural safety and health research and extension projects at Penn State and teaches the course Safety and Health in Agriculture and Biorenewable Industries. Current program areas include applied research and education for tractor and machinery safety issues, youth safety, classification of agricultural deaths and injuries, agricultural safety and health management, methods of modifying farm worker safety behavior, biomass production safety, confined space manure storage safety, and responding to farm injury emergencies. So with that, I'll have Dennis give his presentation. Welcome to this webinar on work safety and health issues that are pertinent to dairy operations. This presentation will take about 30 minutes and I'll touch on several different topics, but will not go into a lot of detail on any of them. The purpose of this webinar is to help everyone understand the breadth and range of major safety and health issues that are important to work safety on dairy farms. These are some of the specific topics that I'll touch on. I'll start with some things that may not be as well known about animal safety, including safety practices around bulls. Next, I'll talk about confined spaces and particularly manure storage and handling. I'll touch on just a couple of things about tractors, machinery, and equipment safety. That will be followed by identification of respiratory hazards associated with many dairy farms. Then I'll talk just a little about OSHA regulations and the OSHA Dairy Dozen and then finish with a few comments about safety and health management planning. Again, I really won't get into a lot of detail about any of these topics, but do hope to give you enough information to help you understand why these topics are important to work safety and health on dairy farms. Animal-related incidents aren't as often fatal as tractor machine-related incidents and usually don't result in amputated limbs, but they do happen often and cause a lot of lost time and medical care. I think most people in ag are aware of the fight and flight zones for livestock. And you can find diagrams like this in any number of ag magazines and, and extension educational resources. But people may be less aware of how animals see and hear. So let's take a quick look at a couple of these things for each of these. Even though cattle have a wide angle of vision, their lens is not as flexible as it is in a human's eye. Therefore, they move their heads up and down in order to focus. They also have pretty poor color distinction. And while they can judge some depth, distance, and speed directly in front of them, they don't do well with any of these when the movement occurs on a side because they are essentially only seeing with one eye. They also have great sensitivity to color contrast, meaning that they often balk at shadows that are across in front of them or uneven surfaces that you are trying to get them to cross. The ears on cattle work independently, normally towards a sound, so that the head can stay still. 
Their ears often follow the eyes so that they are looking at whatever they are hearing. The funnel shape of their ear amplifies sound, which makes the sounds louder and clearer, but then that makes them sensitive to high-pitched noises, and they will try to move away from the source if they can. Background noise, like music, can reduce the startling effect of sudden loud noises, so that's a good thing to have as long as it isn't too loud. And you should use your voice to let animals know where you are. Startled animals can jump and step on people while they are jumping around or turning around to see what the sudden noise or movement is behind them or to their side. The vast majority of fatalities involving bulls are described after the fact you know, by their owners or other family members as being gentle, tame, or almost like a pet. But a bull's temperament will change as it gets older, and sometimes that happens pretty quickly. They also develop territorial instincts and can become very protective of their space. That's why you see the recommendation to change their pens, sheds, corrals every so often so that they don't become so defensive of their space. Injury investigations have shown that many attacks occur after the person has turned their back. You simply can't see what might happen if you turn your back. So we suggest never having your back to a bull. And of course, you should know the signs that suggest a bull is becoming agitated or is about to attack. Anytime you see them staring, having a rigid body, having their ears perked or they're pawing or holding their head high, that's the time to back away and to get out of the pen. If they are showing signs of agitation and then lower their head, that means they are zeroing in and, they, and, and the attack may be imminent. We generally recommend that every bull have a ring in its nose to help a handler control the animal when direct handling or close quarters with the bull is required, as sometimes it is, and a bell around its neck so that the handler always knows where it is and when, it's, when the bull is about to start to move. Pin or fencing pass-throughs like you're seeing here allow a person to get out of an area easily and quickly without opening a gate or having to climb a fence. Other suggestions for safe bull handling include decent pipe fencing so an enraged bull can't simply run through a wire fence or a board fence if he gets agitated or is attacking. It's best if bull holding facilities can be designed or modified so that the bull can be fed, watered, and used for breeding with workers only having minimal direct contact particularly for feeding and watering. It's just an unnecessary risk for the worker to have to be entering the pen on a daily basis. At the first hint of aggression, a bull should not be called, should be called, I'm sorry, a bull should be called. Not the second time, the first time. The general recommendation by animal researchers is that a bull should not be kept past the age of two because they do become unpredictable. And bulls should not be worked alone. And before you enter a pen with a bull, think about how you're going to escape that pen or corral in an emergency. Okay, let's move on and talk briefly about confined spaces on dairy farms. A confined space, by definition, is one that has limited or restricted means of entry or exit, is large enough to enter, but then is not meant to be occupied at all the time. Examples of confined spaces on dairy farms include silos, grain bins and grain hoppers, gravity flow wagons, uh, liquid manure spreaders, milk tanks, and certainly pits and wells, even if your pit or well doesn't have a horse in the bottom of it. Also important to understand from a safety perspective is what makes a confined space an OSHA permit required confined space. A confined space that has one or more of these characteristics or hazards becomes a permit required confined space, which then triggers several recommended safety procedures for safely entering that space. Almost all manure storages are, per are permit required confined spaces, and certainly liquid manure storage tanks are as well. I want to be sure and mention the gas hazards associated with manure storages. There are no, not only toxic gases, but combustible gases and a lot, lack of oxygen in which to breathe. We used to think that these gases were primarily associated with below ground storages, 
but fatalities in the Midwest and some non-fatal incidents here in the, nor in the Northeast suggest that you can have these gases with open air and above ground storages as well. Of the gases, we know that hydrogen sulfide is the most hazardous gas, partly because it deadens your sense of smell, which can lead to a false sense of security. For example, you think you smell it when first entering the barn, but then it goes away, so you don't think about it anymore. And here in the east, we've learned that using gypsum as a bedding source can also increase the level of hydrogen sulfide produced. This slide shows the effects of hydrogen sulfide at different levels in parts per million or ppm. Around 100 parts per million is when the sense of smell goes. 500 to 700 parts per million is when a person will lose consciousness within a few minutes and die relatively quickly if not removed from the exposure. But when a person is exposed to close to 1,000 parts per million, their respiratory system locks up with a, just a couple of breaths they fall unconscious and die within minutes. When the exposure is at this high of a level, a person cannot be resuscitated by mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. It takes medical treatment by either a doctor or perhaps a paramedic that has arrived on the scene. Here are the recommendations for entering any type of indoor storage. And most of these also apply to other types of permit required confined spaces such as uh, upright silos and grain bins. Now we don't have time to go into these in detail, but each of these best safety practices that I'm showing now will help reduce the risk for a person that enters a manure storage. I do want to encourage extension educators and dairy and manure facility planners to check out the ANSI ASAB standard that gives guidance on ventilating manure pits. Proper ventilation goes a long way in, keep, in keeping people alive if they have to enter the pit. You can learn more about the standard at the web link in the video description box. Okay, let's talk for a few minutes about hazards associated with equipment used on dairy farms. There's a fair amount of different types of equipment and they can all be loud and cause noise-induced hearing loss. Moving parts like PTO shafts are often not properly guarded. People often stand under skid, loader, skid uh, loader buckets without blocking out the hydraulic systems. Farm equipment can spend a fair amount of time interacting on public roads with traffic and not having good results. Newer and heavier equipment falls through old barn floors or old floorboards in barns. And ATVs are often not used properly or not weighted properly. All of these things can result in a fatality or a crippling injury. I think most people are relatively familiar with tractor machinery hazards because they cut across all types of farms and ranches and they aren't unique to dairy operations. So I won't spend any more time on this topic now because I think there are other important dairy farm hazards that really should be discussed. For example, from what I see in terms of the way dairy operators store their large round bales, they seem to be unaware that they really can fall and roll, and roll crushing people to death. Sidewalls of bunker silos crack and break, allowing tractors to roll over during packing. Trench silo faces collapse and bury workers under tons of silage. And workers fall down or off upright silos and chutes as they maintain blower pipes, uh, silo unloaders, taking doors in and out, leveling silage, or performing other types of, of silo or, or silage work. And there are serious respiratory hazards associated with upright silos that dairy operators may generally be aware of, but never seem to know any of the details. One of these, is, uh, one of these hazards is silo gas, which is mostly nitrogen dioxide. But silo gas is also referred to as silo fillers disease. Symptoms are often delayed for several hours and range from eye irritation and flu-like symptoms for milder exposures to choking and burning in the chest for more severe exposure. Death from asphy asphyxiation can occur hours after exposure if medical treatment isn't sought immediately upon those exposures. With high exposure, fluid starts to collect in your lungs and the person essentially will eventually drown to death. This is most likely to happen in cases where farmers had a significant exposure, gets out of the silo, feels better immediately because he or she is in fresh air, but eventually lays down because they 
you know, he or she isn't feeling well, or perhaps it's nighttime, and they go to, go to bed and go to sleep. Sometimes after they're asleep, they will wake up vomiting if they're lucky, but other times they never wake up and essentially die or choke to death from their liquid that is collected in their lungs. Best safety practices for silo gas include leveling off and getting the unloader in place immediately after the last load or at the end of the day before the gas has had time to generate at a high level. Ventilate the, ventilating the silo with a blower pipe, but realize that if the silage is more than 15 feet below the blower pipe, air will not get down to the silage level without an additional tube or hose that can direct that air flow downward to the level of the silage. Use fans to ventilate the unloader room. Keep the door closed between the unloader room and barn. And if children are on the farm, lock the doors to keep them out. Post warning signs that say something like danger, silo gas to the present. Use a portable gas monitor and wear it and take or take it with you as you enter the silo. Wait, you know, roughly three weeks to re-enter the silo if you can, but if you can't, then you need to wear a self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBA as it's often called. Always have a second person standing by to assist or to go for help if there is a problem. And if you do smell gas and, and seem to have some effects, leave immediately and then seek medical attention. The other primary respiratory hazard associated with dairy operations is organic dust that can be associated with moldy gray, grain, hay, and silage. There are a variety of respiratory diseases from breathing in moldy dust, but the most serious one is farmer's lung because it's permanent, meaning that there is no cure, and once a person has it, it takes less of an exposure to trigger the ill effects each time that exposure occurs. A farmer with farmer's lung is usually driven off the farm entirely. They simply can't be anywhere near a barn or a hay. There's another disease that mimics farmer's lung, and it's called organic dust toxicity syndrome. The big difference, though, is that organic dust toxicity syndrome is not a sensitizing disease, so a person can get over it, and there is no permanent scarring or damage to the lungs as there is with farmer's lung. Some general symptoms for both farmer's lung and organic dust, uh, organic dust toxicity syndrome includes headaches, dizziness, uh, sore throat, stuffy nose, sneezing, coughing, wheezing, uh, get really tight in the chest, or even have shortness of breath. The best way to minimize dust hazards is, of course, not to let your crops get moldy, but that's pretty difficult to do in, in the real world. So the next best pr protection is the correct type of respirator. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that the inexpensive single strap lightweight paper mask, like I'm showing now, is a respirator, but it is not. It is a dust mask, but it only protects against particle sizes that will never reach the inner lungs where serious damage can occur. The two-strap mask, like you're seeing in the upper right-hand side, is an improved particulate respirator, and that will protect you against respiratory disease if it is worn correctly. But fitting and wearing a respirator correctly is not necessarily intuitive and is best accomplished with training rather than just leaving it for individuals to figure out on their own. The photo on the lower right is a power air purifying respirator. It is much more effective than a two-strap particulate respirator, but of course, is considerably more expensive. But once a person has a respiratory illness, they may have to go to a device like this just to stay in farming or to be around hay, hay or silage. Okay, let's move on to OSHA and how it relates to dairy farms. How OSHA applies to farms in the small farm exemption has been discussed extensively in the ag press, so I'll not cover those details here. But what many dairy operators, operations do not seem to understand is that even though there are a minimal number of OSHA standards specifically applicable to farms, if OSHA does inspect the dairy farm, they can still find a way to cite the farm for OSHA violations. This is most often done through what's called the general duty clause. The general duty clause says that 
All employers have to furnish employees a place of employment free of recognized hazards. The important point in this statement is that it doesn't make any difference whether the employer, or example, the dairy farmer, recognizes the hazard. It's what the safety profession has recognized as hazards that really counts. What I want to do now is to quickly identify OSHA standards that are relevant to dairy operations and then move on to what is called the OSHA Dairy Dozen. These are the three OSHA Ag standards that address tractor safety and are applicable to dairy farms. The 1910-28.51 standard is the one that requires employees to use ROPS protected tractors and to receive annual training and safe tractor operation. The other two standards define the testing procedures for approved ROPS and essentially keeps farmers from trying to weld together their own ROPS like someone did in the photo on the far left. This is the ag machinery standard that requires all drive shafts, belts, chains, augers, etc., to be properly guarded. It also contains a provision for annual training. And of course, we want guarding to look like the top uh, two photos rather than the bottom two photos. These are OSHA standards that are not specific to ag, but are applicable to dairy operations. Farms with 11 or more employees are often cited for failure to follow provisions in the anhydrous ammonia standard, assuming that you have anhydrous ammonia on the farm, uh, for failure to have safety data sheets readily available to employees, and for not keeping lights working in SMV, SMV emblems in good shape on tractors or other machinery. Here are the rest of the OSHA standards that are applicable to dairy operations. Again, failure to comply with these standards if the farm has 11 or more employees often result in citations. The lockout, tagout standard violations in particular are often cited on dairy farms. And mention of tagout, lockout, or lockout, tagout provides a transition to the OSHA dairy dozen. The OSHA dairy dozen came about from what is called the an OSHA local emphasis program, or LEP. Wisconsin was the first state to develop an LEP for dairy operations, and they were joined by New York a few years later. Within the LEP, or, or Local Emphasis Program, OSHA has identified 12 hazard areas that their inspectors will look at when they visit a dairy farm. Some of these areas have very specific standards associated with them, such as tractor operation, but others don't, such as working with dairy animals. All the areas shown on this slide do have specific OSHA standards associated with the hazard area. And under area nine in particular, the hazardous communication standard, it's one of the most commonly cited standards for agricultural operations. Here are the three final areas. The confined, space, confined spaces area is an example of a dairy dozen hazard area where agriculture was specifically excluded from the original OSHA standard. But since the LEP has identified this as an area of concern, OSHA inspectors can use the general duty clause to make citations if the farm is not in compliance with the standard. If you aren't familiar with OSHA LEPs as it applies to dairy operations, check out the references. There are links to both the Wisconsin and the New York programs in the video description box. The final area to mention in this webinar is about taking a proactive approach to safety and health management. This is the primary reference document for this topic. Work safety and health does not happen by luck, even if a business operation has been fortunate enough to have never suffered a serious or fatal work injury. What I will show on the next few slides is a way to organize a work safety and health program a few principles that provide a rationale for safety and health management planning, and a few of the tools that are available to help dairy farm owners and operators manage work safety and health at their operation. Here are a few principles that underline much of what drives safety and health management. These principles have evolved from years of research with multiple industrial and occupational groups, including agriculture, 
it is, it is important that dairy uh, owners, managers, supervisors understand and embrace these principles because it's difficult to stay motivated and be proactive before a serious incident occurs. But that is specifically the point about being proactive with work safety and health. These are the primary components of any good safety and health management plan. I you know, can't go into a lot of detail about any one component, but I will show some of the tools associated with components three, four, five, and six, because these are the areas where many managers and operators seem to be the least knowledgeable about. For example, many people use simple hazard checklists to identify worksite hazards, but forms like this are very limited in the real world. Worksite hazards do not exist in a yes or no format, and a checklist like this does nothing to help you evaluate and prioritize hazards from most hazards to least hazards, so that you know what really is important to fix right away and what can be left for a, more, a reasonable period of time. Here's an example of a more objective and informative hazard inspection form. It identifies the hazard, and has a rating scale that provides evaluative and ranking functions at the same time. A one is always the best or least hazardous scenario, and a five is always the worst or most hazardous scenario for that particular hazard. A scale like this tells you what should be done to remove or correct the hazard as well. There are 12 different hazard items that can be checked on a tractor, such as roll bar, the roll bar, the seat belt, the uh, PTO, stub guard, the SMB emblem, lights, tires, and more. If a tractor has, say, if, if a farm has, say, five tractors, and this type of form is used on all of them, it then gives you an average score for tractors on the farm. Applying this type of a hazard inspection form to all machines, structures, shops, and other hazard areas would also let you develop a hazard score for the entire farm operation. Here's another example of a hazard inspection form that performs all three functions that make up a good inspection form. This form adds specific work tasks to the consideration of the physical hazard that, that may be present. This form also has fewer evaluative choices than a previous form, and they are not numeric, so it may take more work if you want to develop an average score. But still, this is far better than a form that only gives you a choice of yes or no, or maybe safe or unsafe. And like the other form, it lets you know what to do to correct the hazard, which is always a good, good thing. Here's a tool that helps guide a person as they think about options for eliminating and reducing hazards that are identified. It's almost always easier to provide work, a worker with prote personal protective equipment to protect against the hazard. And that's, but that's the bottom, the bottom level thing. But that, you know, but providing a worker with personal protective equipment does nothing to eliminate or control the hazard itself. And it means that you're relying on the worker to always wear the PPE properly and when they need it. It's always more effective and permanent to apply the top three strategies rather than the bottom three strategies. Here's another tool called job safety analysis that combines hazard identification with safety training. When jobs are broken down into the JSA format, it gives you a tool that identifies each step of a job, the ways a person could get hurt while performing that step, and the right ways to do the step and job so that no one does get hurt. This is a tool that was developed in the industrial safety field and is a staple of companies that are recognized as leaders in worker safety and health. It is always a challenge to have safety training that is interesting, relevant, and positive. Unfortunately, a lot of safety training is done through canned videos and PowerPoint presentations that do not connect well with a specific operation or a group of workers. But there are ways to make safety training relevant and fresh. One of these ways is to use current events such as a recent injury incident or maybe a newspaper story about children, for, for instance, children being hurt, to engage workers in structured, a structured discussion. A structured discussion means that you ask open-ended questions that help guide workers to discuss important safety information. 
the point of this type of training isn't to get everyone to necessarily agree of what might happen in an incident or an accident or even to agree how to raise children safely on a farm but it's to get them thinking and talking and sharing their own strategies and experiences for achieving uh, safety in, in the, on the farm or particularly in dairy operations. Here's a specific training method called job instruction training that works well with job safety analysis. A job safety analysis with that JSA tells you what to teach, but JIT helps with the how of teaching. Each step in the JIT is important for this technique to work properly, but step three is really the key. What is important about step three is that the worker has to repeat the steps of the instruction, including your explanations of why this is a safe way to do the job. A person that cannot repeat instructions usually doesn't remember doesn't usually understand the, act, the instructions or the steps that they're about to do, nor are they going to remember the instructions the next time they have to do the job. Okay, this is the final slide on this topic and just shows a structured method to self-evaluate your overall program. You can organize a safety program audit formed by the major components that I listed earlier. You can do it by the major activities that would operationalize your program components, or you can use specific hazards or safety topics such as tractors, machinery and equipment, confined spaces, regulatory compliance, and, or, or other types of, of uh, topics. Okay, this completes this webinar. Feel free to contact me if you have other, any questions or want additional detail on some of the topics that I've covered. Dennis, I'd like to thank you for this very insightful information, very important information for those of us working on dairy farms. I'd like to remind the audience of the resources that DairyXNet can provide to you, our website, and this video will be uh, archived on our website. Thank you.